small confusion that you people may have in that which I would love to explain. Let me read the problem first. In a lift moving up with 5 meters per second square acceleration, see look at the unit there, a ball is dropped from a height of 1.25 meters. Find the time taken by the ball to hit the floor of the lift, right? So there is a ball which has been dropped from a height of 1.25 meters from a person who is already in the lift, right? Okay, but don't forget that the lift is moving upwards with an acceleration of 5 meter per second square. Now, I think that this confusion is what exactly I had discussed once in my previous problem of this particular episode and that was the meaning of the word dropped which may confuse you people. Because he has said that the ball has been dropped, you might be under the impression again that the initial velocity of the ball is 0. You are correct also, but you should also understand the frame of reference with respect to which you are correct. If you are talking with respect to the lift or with respect to the person who is inside the lift who has simply dropped the ball, then you are correct. No doubt that the initial velocity of that ball with respect to the person who has dropped the ball is 0. But if you speak in the language of a person who is standing on the ground, then the initial velocity of that ball will not be 0. It will be same as the velocity with which the lift is already moving upwards. Right? But there is an advantage in solving the problem in the frame of reference attached to the lift. But there is also a small uh, correction which you are supposed to make. That is, if the lift is an accelerating frame, as you can see clearly there, it is moving upwards with 5 meters per second square acceleration. Therefore, you are supposed to write the acceleration of the ball with respect to the lift, making use of the concept of relative acceleration. Let me write that first. Acceleration of the ball with respect to the lift will be acceleration of the ball minus acceleration of the lift. Acceleration of the ball after you have dropped it will be 10 meter per second square in the downward direction minus acceleration of the lift is given to be 5 meter per second square in the upward direction. Therefore, it will be minus 5 and that makes it 10 plus 5 which is 15 meter per second square and positive. So, how do you interpret this? See 10 meter per second square which was in the downward direction has been taken as positive and after having written the relative acceleration you have got a positive answer. So, that indicates 15 meter per second square is also in the downward direction. So, now you know the acceleration and what about the initial velocity of the ball with respect to the lift? 0 because the person who is standing on the lift is at rest and he has just dropped the ball. Therefore, you know the initial velocity, you know the acceleration, you know how much distance the ball after having dropped is supposed to travel to reach the floor of the lift. Therefore, you can use S equal to ut plus half a t square wherein S will be 1.25 u t will be 0, I hope you agree, initial velocity is 0 plus I am solving the problem in the frame of reference attached to the lift, so the initial velocity is 0, a we have already found out to be 15 and time is what we intend to find. Now, if you solve this, you will get t square equal to 2.5 divided by 15 or you can write it as 25 divided by 150 or you get t is equal to 1 by root of 6. And if you just calculate what is the value of 1 by root of 6, you will get 0.4 seconds and therefore, d is the correct option there. d is the correct option, 1 by root 6. So, lastly, uh, one more category of uh, problems which are asked in this one dimension and two dimension motion and that is problems on graphs. So, here we expect the student to know all the standard graphs and their meanings. Like for example, if you take a speed versus time graph, if you take a speed versus time graph, then the slope of that graph is going to give you the magnitude of the acceleration. If you take velocity versus time graph, then the slope of that graph will give you the acceleration. Similarly, if you take displacement versus time graph, you will get the velocity as the slope and if you take distance versus time graph, you will get the speed as the slope. 
right? So like that, and of course, I also want you people to understand what exactly is this slope that I am referring. Slope is basically uh, the tan of the angle that the tangent is going to make with the time axis. Suppose a curve is given to you, a graph is given to you, you simply draw a tangent at the given point and check the angle that the tangent makes with the time axis. See, this is the problem. Displacement versus time graph is given for two particles. Both are straight lines, luckily, the graphs are straight lines. One is particle A, whose displacement versus time is a straight line making an angle of 30 degree with the time. And another is for the particle B, which is also a straight line, but making an angle of 45 degree with the time axis. Now, as it's a displacement time graph, the slope of the displacement time graph should give you the velocity. And luckily, he wants the ratio of the velocities of the two particles. So, if you write tan of the angle made by this line with the time axis, that is tan 30, that will give you the velocity of A. And then tan of the angle made by this line with the time axis, which is tan 45, that gives you the velocity of B. Therefore, the answer is tan of 30 divided by tan of 45 is nothing but VA divided by VB. Now, how much is tan 30? Tan 30 is 1 by root 3 and tan 45 is 1. So, answer is 1 is to root 3 and that is nothing but D option. Therefore, this is correct. This episode, now we will try to discuss problems based on Newton's laws of motion. See, in Newton's laws of motion, a few of the important problems that we can discuss are the one which is based on equilibrium, the ones in which collision is involved, the ones in which uh, accelerating frame of reference is used and the idea of pseudo force has to be utilized. So like this. So these are a couple of areas in which the problems can be expected. So let us start with the first one. Even friction plays a very, very important role. I think one should have a very clear understanding about friction. So here, I recollect a couple of things to be shared with you people about friction. There are two types of friction. One is kinetic and the other is static. Okay, how to come to know whether the friction is kinetic or static? If a block is already moving on a particular surface, then the friction between the block and the surface is kinetic. And kinetic friction has got only one value given by the formula mu into n. Of course, you can say it is mu k into n. That is the coefficient of kinetic friction into the normal reaction. But if it is a static friction, then the body will not be moving on the surface. This is how you can identify whether the friction is static or not. But one very important aspect of static friction that I want you people to understand is static friction can take several values. There are infinite number of values which the static friction can take up. You don't have any formula to find out all those intermediate values. You have a formula just to find out the maximum value of the static friction. And that is mu into n again. Or to be more precise, you can say mu s into n, where n is the normal reaction of the surface on the body. Fine? So with this much of understanding about friction and a couple of things which I said can also come up in the Newton's laws chapter like the idea of pseudo force, equilibrium, uh, momentum, that is collision problems. Let us start with the first one. A block is kept on a rough surface, rough surface, and the block starts sliding when the inclination of the surface is theta with the horizontal. Coefficient of friction between the block and the surface is how much? Some options have been given there. So what you can notice here is that there is a rough surface, so definitely between the block that you have kept on the rough surface and the rough surface, there is going to be a friction. So initially the block was kept and it was not ready to come down the incline all by itself. But the moment you started slowly increasing the inclination with the horizontal and the inclination became theta, the block started sliding down. So what is the coefficient of friction? So what we will do here is just draw that situation and try to understand how to get the coefficient of friction. So this is the inclined plane. This is the inclination of the inclined plane. Say so this is that block. See, I'm calling it to be a block, but I'm just showing it as a particle because we are discussing only the particle concept here. 
weight is acting downwards normal reaction of the surface is acting like this and because the block has a tendency to slide down the plane the friction should be acting up the plane and that is still static so just before the block will start sliding down the plane the block was at rest with respect to the plane therefore the friction was static now you resolve this mg into two mutually perpendicular directions see this this angle will be theta so this component of mg will be mg cos theta and the component down the plane will be mg sin theta therefore as long as mg sin theta doesn't become equal to fs so long the block will not slide down the plane therefore the value of fs should be exactly equal to mg sin theta this is the value of the friction static friction which has just balanced mg sin theta a component of the weight down the plane now what is the maximum value of friction static friction it is mu into n so mu is mu which you want to find out and n is mg cos theta so mu mg cos theta might have become equal to mg sin theta when the block is about to slide down the plane so mg gets cancelled you transfer cos theta to that side that makes it tan theta equal to mu and that is the coefficient of friction between the block and the surface so c is the correct option there so that's the answer